Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is not well known for its romance. Almost every version has little to none, with the most common being the relationship between turtle allies April O'Neil and Casey Jones. Romance for the four main turtles is pretty rare, but not completely non-existent. Between every medium, the comics have had the most amount of romance, but looking across all continuities, they keep it pretty light. None of the movies have had any serious romance for the turtles, and four out of five of the TV series keep it pretty low to non-existent as well. Rise only has two, maybe three romances in the whole show, one of which is a past relationship that is only a focus in one episode, the other is the romance between two villains that also gets a one episode focus and is very fully a parody of censorship, and then the subtextual indication that Draxum is into Lujitsu. It's never been confirmed, but in my heart, they're divorced. None of these involve the turtles. 2003 literally has no romance besides Casey and April, and while there are relationships that people can, and did, interpret as romantic, nothing is ever confirmed. 1987 does have some romance for three of the turtles, but the biggest advantage of 1987 is that there's almost 200 episodes, and almost all of them are one-offs that never affect the characters. So you can easily skip any episode that has romance if you want, except for maybe the first one, but that's just because it's part of the first story arc of the whole show. <laughs> and then there's Next Mutation, which not only added a girl turtle named Venus for all the boys to crush on, they also made it so that the boys are not blood related so that they can hit on her because she was part of the same group of turtles that got originally mutated, which for some reason they did, instead of just having her be another random turtle that got mutated. That would have saved everyone from hearing the most awkward conversation in TMNT history. So I am not your sister? No, uh, you and I are just mutant boy and mutant girl. <laughs> Leo, I will pay you to stop. But when people do think of TMNT romance, the series that they probably first think of is the 2012 series. And its romances do engulf all other versions, as right from the very beginning, it's apparent that turtle romance is going to be a big part of it, as you are smacked right in the face with the first one. The thing about 2012, though, is that it has a couple of major problems that stay throughout pretty much the whole show. And while I think most people will try and defend any of the other problems, even its most hardcore fans find it hard to argue in favor of the romances. I'm going to go through each of the turtle romances and try to explain how I think the writers got the idea for these romances and what did and did not work about them as well as how these relationships could have been improved and how future TMNT productions reacted to these romances. With the one last caveat that there isn't anything inherently wrong with giving the turtles love interests or if you enjoy any of the relationships I talk about. I'm just trying to explain what didn't work for most people with these relationships. Thank you, but it's not your fight. Yes, it is. It's fitting to start with Donnie and April, as their romance is introduced right in the first episode of the show. Donnie having a crush on April isn't too far out there of an idea, even if it hasn't been done in past versions. Most likely, the idea for this relationship came from the O3 series. In that series, the turtle April is closest to is Donnie due to their shared love of science. As a result, they team up for a good chunk of the science stuff in the series. In fact, there were people that shipped the two together, preferring them over that series version of Casey and April. April, I'll need your help! Hey, that sneaky little green nerd just stole my day! <laughs> you know, if you say things like that, Casey, they may turn out to be true! The 2012 series is actually the first time Donnie ever has a romance, though. He was the only turtle to not have a love interest in the 1987 series, although there were fans that defaulted to shipping him with April's co-worker slash bestie Irma. And if you watch 2012, you might get the idea that it's actually better that Donnie doesn't have a love interest. Unless you're a diehard stan for every version of this ship. Most people know that April and Donnie's relationship was done very badly in 2012, often being considered one of the lowest points of the franchise. Well, not that low. The problems start right from the beginning, as April is introduced from Donnie's perspective, him having a crush on her. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with someone instantly finding someone attractive when they first meet, or even finding a random stranger you pass on the street hot. It happens in real life all the time. But the problem is how it presents April for the rest of the series. Aside from the fact that if you weren't familiar with past TMNT iterations, you wouldn't understand why this random girl is significant enough for Donnie to have a crush on, because 2012's inability to not understand that people not familiar with TMNT beforehand are watching it because that's a convo for a different day. The problem is that this is the first look that we have at April for the series. Other versions of TMNT will typically have it so that April isn't introduced from the turtle's perspective. Most of the time she's doing her own thing, but then ends up getting saved by the turtles and becoming their friends. It sets up the character as an individual so the audience can form their own opinion and expectations for the character before seeing how she interacts with the turtles themselves. Even Michael Bay knew to do this. But 2012 introduces her as an entirely silent entity from the perspective of Donnie having a random crush on her and getting kidnapped five seconds later, presenting this idea that she isn't going to be a fully rounded character, that she's just going to be someone for the turtles to rescue and Donnie's future girlfriend. She's also specifically rescued by Donnie, adding a subconscious perception of their relationship, which is really upsetting because even though past versions of April did need to be rescued, there was never any romantic context to it. I would now like to propose a new standard of media test in the same vein as the Bechdel test and Makomori test, the April O'Neil test. This test would be that if there is a main group of five with only one female character, that female character cannot be a love interest for the other four. She can have love interests, but they cannot be one of the guys. An example, Alora from the original Voltron does not pass this test since she is the only girl and Keith's love interest. Legendary Defender doesn't either, but the test is obsolete in that case due to Pidge being a girl in that version. April will pass this test in most versions. This version obviously does not. And boy is that upsetting given that she's the most well-known female character in the franchise, and this probably painted a picture of her for certain people as just Donnie's love interest. I haven't even gotten past the first 10 seconds of this romance. Oh my god. A lot of the time, it's presented that Donnie is more into the idea of April than April herself. Seen within the first five minutes of the second episode, when he assumes that April is going to like him just based on the idea that he's a scientist like her dad. And stuff like this will continue throughout the show, keeping this idea that Donnie's crush on April is very surface level. It's hard to change that perception when Donnie immediately gets a crush on 1987 April when he just gets one look at her. And the show barely does anything to make their relationship more than that. To ever give us reasons why Donnie actually likes April other than finding her hot. Almost every interaction that they have is Donnie just crushing on her while April just stands there. The fact that they barely have a dynamic outside of that is really frustrating, especially if you watch Rise or O3. In both of these shows, their dynamic is very fleshed out and fun to follow for episodes at a time. And O3 and Rise depict the April and Donnie relationship very differently from each other, so 12 should have been able to show their dynamic without having to fully copy the O3 version. But we don't get that. Instead, the three main things we see of their relationship is Donnie wanting to study April's powers, Donnie trying to find ways to help April's dad, and Donnie just having giant heart eyes over April. But for the first one, we never see how their personalities work off of each other as they work with April's powers. Aside from the fact that these scenes are very rare, they're mostly just Donnie going, do this, and April proceeding to try and do something. It could be transplanted onto any other characters, and it would make just as much sense. Donnie finding cures for her dad that keeps getting mutated, however, isn't actually a dynamic. It's basically just used to show that Donnie is doing this for April because he has a crush on her. And the final part of their dynamic is just the hard eyes. And I mean literal hard eyes. The show takes a lot of anime inspiration in adding the over-the-top visuals from time to time, and you can determine whether you like that or not. It's not for everyone. April does anything and Donnie immediately has to make it about his crush on her. And his attempts at flirting with April are never cute. They're more awkward and uncomfortable. You're way prettier. Not that I think you're pretty. I mean, I mean, you're not ugly. It's just that I go... Don't fight it. You'll thank me later. I'm thanking you now. <laughs> what doesn't help is that the two don't have anything in common. 
There's the implication that April is really smart and is into science, outright saying she's a straight A student, but they never actually show it outside of the fact that she ends up tutoring Casey. They could have made it a point to show why she and Donnie work well together like the O3 series did. I am sorry I keep bringing it up. I will do my best to stop now. It probably won't stop. But instead, she almost never gets to show that she knows anything about science, only the implication. Leaving the only other possible commonality for the two is April learning ninjutsu, which is something we never see them doing together outside of some group training sessions. They never end up doing things together outside of testing April's psychic abilities or talking about the plot. And the writers could have used the time exploring April's psychic abilities to also show Donnie and April bonding and exploring a real relationship, but instead all we get is science talk and Donnie hard eyes. But it's kind of hard to make a dynamic between the two when the writers can never decide what to do with April. This could literally be its own video, and I don't want to come off as bashing the character, but April isn't written very well in this series. Basically, it's a lot of adding plot and quickly forgetting it when it comes to her character, or just mishandling of a lot of possible interesting plots and characterization. The untapped potential of this show. But if people end up not liking a character, that makes it very hard to root for them being in a relationship with someone. Whether it's because a character isn't written very interesting, they're barely there in the show itself, or they're just annoying, if you don't like a character, you won't want them to be in a relationship with a character you do like. Or sometimes you don't like the way either is written, especially in terms of their relationship, but that's what the video is about. <laughs> Donnie is the one who most consistently gets to express any kind of concern for April if she's in danger. None of the other brothers get to do so that often, and most of the time they never get to spend time with her for more than a few short interactions. There's only one episode dedicated to April being friends with a turtle that isn't Donnie, and it never happens again. Mikey and Raph are hung out to dry for being friends with April, and it makes her feel cut off from the group as a whole. Instead, it feels like when your friend gets a new partner and decides that they are a part of your friend group rather than someone being naturally integrated into this already established group. I really quickly want to talk about the way certain fans perceive April in terms of this relationship, though, because a lot of people seem to think that April is just an emotionally manipulative person who is leading Donnie on because she likes attention. What show did y'all watch? <laughs> like, I get that she's not the best written character, but is all of this just because she sometimes gives him cheek kisses? I really can't think of anything else other than she doesn't say right from the get-go that she doesn't like him. I'll get to that later. The other thing that gets brought up is when she kills Donnie. She doesn't. Aside from the fact that he was fine, she was possessed by an alien who killed him. If you blame her for things that happen while she was possessed, you also need to hold the guys accountable from the time they were possessed. The thing is, we need to get to the most hated aspect of almost any TV show, the love triangle. Season two introduces Casey Jones to the show, and like I said, he and April are the TMNT couple, meaning that almost every iteration will have them get together or be romantically involved in some way. It doesn't mean that the media is automatically bad if they don't get together, but there is an expectation that things will turn out that way. Casey being into April is set up right from his first episode, and I know some people like this version of them, but... <sighs> Chanel and Walmart. I don't like that Casey is introduced hitting April with a hockey puck and being rude, not apologizing. I don't like that he then pressures her to be his tutor by leaning over her uncomfortably. I don't like how he over-sexualizes her at any given opportunity. Honestly, April, I have no idea what you see in that guy. Same, Irma, same. The love triangle really doesn't develop April and Casey's relationship either. All you get is that Casey finds April hot and she might like him back. Emphasis on might. But the love triangle brings forth a very negative aspect of Donnie, and that's his jealousy. It was actually shown pretty early on when Mikey hugged April and he was jealous over it, even though Mikey very clearly doesn't like April that way. He feels entitled to her at every opportunity and at every rescue. He also gets jealous when Zever hits on April and, oh my god, that is a grown-ass man, Hitting on a teenage girl. Why did you approve of this Nickelodeon? <laughs> but it's brought up a lot more as he becomes incredibly jealous right away over Casey, despite the fact that he doesn't even know if they're dating or not. He just sees the two at the park at night, which, by the way, no teenage girl would ever suggest going to a park at night for hanging out with someone she barely knows. 
You go to a public, well-lit building and send texts to 100 people telling them where you're going to be so that if you go missing, they know who to interrogate first. Donnie just becomes instantly jealous and assumes that the two are on a date. The jealousy never goes away, and yes, Casey always gets jealous over Donnie and April as well. But neither of them ever actually look to see if April is reacting positively to them getting to hang out or just flirting with her. They always look at each other, and aside from it fueling some specific shippers, it makes the love triangle more obviously not about April. It's about Casey and Donnie as characters and never her. So yes, April never turns down Casey or Donnie, and a lot of fans blame her for all the faults of the relationship. They see her as someone who just wants attention from two guys fighting over her. But that's not what I see. I want to talk about the episode where Leo gets thrown out a window. Look, it's not TMNT unless Leo gets either physically, metaphorically, or emotionally thrown through a window. Donnie gets hurt and April is patching him up and he clearly is about to confess his feelings. She stops him by tightening his bandage a little too much and saying this. You should stop talking. It just makes things hurt more. When everyone else sees is a manipulative teenage girl dragging Donnie along because she likes the attention. What I see is someone who doesn't want to break her friend's heart by turning him down. And you can see this in a lot of her reactions to when Donnie is overly romantic to her. She's not enjoying the intention. She feels awkward and doesn't know what to say. She also chooses to ignore it when Donnie says something romantic by accident, making it so that she can backtrack what she's saying and they can pretend that it didn't happen. When you're a girl and you have a friend that very obviously has a crush on you, it is very uncomfortable especially when they've made it obvious to everyone around you that they have that crush on you. Because you're not blind, you can see it. And they're your friend, and you have the same friends, and maybe you'll turn out to be the bad guy if you break this person's heart. But you're not trying to break their heart. You were just nice to them, and you just don't feel the same way. It's not like you can force yourself to like them. Maybe if they actually just asked you out relatively soon after they started liking you, you could solve this problem in your relationship, but now... I've been April twice, and there's plenty of girls who've been her more than I have. It's not comfortable to be in this situation of trying to find a way to let someone down while trying not to hurt them. Sometimes you just don't know how to tell someone that you don't want to be with them. It's not April's fault that she doesn't like either Casey or Donnie, that sometimes it makes her uncomfortable when they get romantic with their interactions and she doesn't know how to voice it. She is a teenage girl who doesn't know the best way to handle it. Do I think that the writers intended this to come across that way? I don't know. But if enough people can say that April was leading Donnie on for attention, then I can say that she's an awkward teenage girl who doesn't know how to express that she doesn't want to date her friend without hurting him. Also, she did try and turn down Casey, then they got attacked. First episode of season three, y'all. That being said, April's crimes in these relationships are never as bad as the guys. Aside from both Casey and Donnie repeatedly passing her physical and emotional boundaries, Donnie also stalks April. And you know this how? Um, maybe I was following her. Well, that's not creeptastic. At least someone is willing to call him out on his behavior. Mikey and Leo don't really call out Donnie for his behavior towards April, it's more making fun of him, which the boys do all the time. But Raph is the one who points out that things are never going to happen. I just wish he called Donnie out even more than he already did, but that might make the audience question if this is a good relationship or not. The only good thing about the Donnie-April relationship is that it starts to die down in the last two seasons. There's probably four episodes in these two seasons that directly reference that Donnie is ever into April, and boy, is it a relief! It's also the season where April starts to voice that she's uncomfortable. Okay, you guys are creeping me out. Uh, okay, what did I say about group hugs? It only happens twice! But I will take it! <laughs> Despite season 4 being the point where the romance starts to die, and die hard, the first episode of the season made me realize what this romance actually is. This ship is a self-insert fantasy 
by the male writers. Let me explain. If you were on YouTube prior to 2012 and watched any review of the 87 series, then you would know that a lot of guys who grew up watching 87 have the hots for April. Not every version of April, specifically the version from 87. I'm not saying they don't find other versions attractive, but 87 is typically the version they bring up the most. The jumpsuit is apparently a big factor. Now, a lot of these guys are particularly nerdy, and many of the writers for 2012 grew up on 87. It's not hard to come to the conclusion that nerdy male writers who grew up having a crush on April as kids would want to make her a love interest for the nerdy turtle that they relate to. And seeing this clip made me realize it. It also makes me uncomfortable because that's a teenage girl. Her outfit and even her laser gun are direct references to 87 April. Despite all of the garbage that is this romance, I would be more okay with it existing if there was any kind of closure. If April had gotten with Donnie, actually no, or if Donnie had shown that he got over April, then at least you could say there's an end, but there's not. But there almost was. So let's talk about the episode, A Foot Too Big. This is considered the worst episode of the show, but it's also one of the worst things the entire franchise has put out. I say this as someone who has seen all of Next Mutation twice. <laughs> the worst episode of the 2003 series isn't even on the same level as this. Because with that one, everyone hates it because everyone involved acts completely out of character to get the bad plot going. However, with A Foot Too Big, everyone is completely in character and it's still awful. Doug Longdale is my personal enemy, but so is everyone else involved who got this mess greenlit. Anyways, this episode is a lot of things. Mostly weird and uncomfortable. So it starts out with Donnie making a music box for April. A music box with a picture of him in it. Which would be a cute romantic gesture, if a little egocentric, if they were already in a relationship. Or if she had a broken music box and he fixed it for her, or if she collected music boxes. There are ways to make something like this not feel weird. But none of these things are in the series, so when Donnie presents April with the music box, she's weirded out and comes up with a half-baked excuse to leave. Then they find an injured Bigfoot in the woods and take her home where she develops a crush on Donnie. The goal of this episode is to make a comparison with the way Donnie treats April and the way Bigfoot treats Donnie. Now, there are people in the world that don't realize they make people uncomfortable with their romantic advancements until the same thing happens to them with the person they don't find attractive. But if the episode's goal is to compare how Bigfoot treats Donnie to how he treats April, it fails because Bigfoot never does the same things that Donnie did. Yes, she makes him gifts with the intent of romance and makes her romantic intentions known, but mostly what she does is grab Donnie and make him do romantic things with her. And the amount of uncomfortableness you have with this episode may vary, but for me, it's the most uncomfortable I've ever been while watching a kid's show. Donnie laments at one point about Bigfoot's affections, and Raph says that now he knows how April feels. The episode ends with Donnie going to April to tell her that he will no longer be pursuing her romantically because he realizes that she sees him the way he sees Bigfoot. And for a few brief seconds, there is this relief. The moment where you think the love triangle's over. Donnie's crush on April is over. I don't have to deal with this anymore. I'm free! And then April kisses Donnie. Wow. I hate it. There was an opportunity to teach a lesson to Ken. A lesson that is only ever taught using gay people but really needs to also be taught using straight people. Which is that sometimes you get a crush on someone and they don't like you back. And you need to respect their feelings and recognize that you can't change that. That would have been a great lesson. But having April kiss Donnie and Donnie respond with, I understand nothing, takes away what would have been a good lesson. And even if April did turn him down officially at the end of the episode, it presents this idea that she's turning him down because he's a mutant. That that's the only problem she would have with wanting to date Donnie. 
but the problem could easily be fixed if they just talked a little bit more. Just have her give her reason for not liking Donnie, not that he's a mutant. And for some reason, there's this fandom perception that Donnie stopped being as aggressive with his crush on April after this episode. He does not. Yes, it does become less frequent, like I said, but a good chunk of the moments are still uncomfortable to watch. So there's no conclusion. It's no fun, and honestly is overall a bad message for any kids watching this show. So how does future TMNT media respond to this relationship? Well, in Rise, Donnie and April are besties, and really close. Once again, having her be the closest to him out of any of the Turtles. But unlike O3, their friendship doesn't come from a shared love of science, but other interests that they have. Because she's a reporter again. God, do I hate it when she's a reporter! They share favorite movies, they have similar ways of thinking through things, and yeah, people ship these two in this version. And apparently some fans get weird at people who ship this version because they have more of a sibling-like relationship. To be fair, I said that about Loki and Sylvie, and then those two were apparently in love after knowing each other for 12 hours, so you know what? I don't know where TV shows will ever go. And I really don't get harassment over shipping, but I don't ever see any other versions of the ship where people get this mad at the fans. Jeez, I wonder what's different about these versions that's different in the Rise version. It's a mystery. Honestly, I would have been okay if Rise had Donnie and April be a thing, just because their relationship actually works in this version. Like, I don't ship it, ship it, but if the writers put in the effort, I think people could have gotten on board. And then with Casey and April, Rise has Casey split into two characters, Cassandra Jones and her future son, Casey Jr. Neither have a romance with April, but in our hearts, we all know Cassandra and April would have gotten together, and she is Casey Jr.'s second mom. <laughs> On the rooftop? You could have finished me, but you didn't. Because you're the first thing in this city that doesn't bore me. <laughs> this is the most controversial of all the romances. Like Donnie and April, Leo and Karai being romantic interests doesn't come out of nowhere, but unlike April, Karai's relationship with Leo is a mix of two others, her 2003 counterpart and the 87 character Lotus Blossom. Leo has the least amount of love interests out of all the turtles, as the only one besides Lotus and Cry is the character Raven Shadowheart, but it's only in an alternate possible future. While the lack of love interest for Donnie led to its own headcanons, Leo's have led to others which might be culminating in Rise. Please let that show get renewed. Lotus Blossom in the 87 series causes the Krang Shredder divorce when she is set to replace Shredder as the head of the Foot Clan, but only because she likes money. Leo ends up falling for her and she ends up feeling the same. It doesn't work out because he doesn't respect her career of being a hired criminal. I love 87 so much. <laughs> Karai in the O3 series would end up being more of an influence for the 12 version in terms of both characterization and relationship with Leo. They're meant to be foils for one another and end up meeting often throughout the series. When I was six years old and didn't know what age gaps or being gay was, I was down for this. I didn't see the episode where she stabbed him until I was older. So I was really excited to see if they would bring Karai into the 2012 version and what they would do with her. I like Karai's character intro better than April's. She starts out mysterious in most versions, so introducing her as someone who knocks Leo on his butt and immediately leaves is pretty good. Leo's crush on her is portrayed a lot more subtle than any of the other brothers' crushes. Rather than the explosion of hearts and sparkles that we normally get, his eyes just get really wide. It's portrayed as an initial attraction, but not a love at first sight that almost all of the other romances are going for. They actually have a really good setup for a relationship in the initial episode. They show a shared skill in studying new jitsu, as well as some really good interactions as to how Karai will be as a character. Also, how their dynamic can play out, and it's super fun to watch. I actually want to sit here and describe every interaction they have in their relationship because it's genuinely really good. Every interaction builds off one another, and yeah, their dynamic is pretty classic Batman and Catwoman, but it still feels unique to them. Early on, Leo expresses actual reasons why he likes Karai. Karai is fun, and he doesn't get to do a lot of that as the responsible one. I also love that Leo is a lot calmer about his crush, but still gets to be excited about it when he goes to talk to April. And she also gets to freak out over his crush, while also being a grounded voice of reason to remind him... Cause she's in the Foot Clan! So originally I had a comment um, about how Leo is 
the only turtle to never have a crush on April from any universe up to and including concept art. And then Mutant Mayhem came out. <laughs> and this dynamic between Karai and Leo keeps up throughout the whole season. There is the problem of it falling into I can fix her territory, which can be really uncomfortable for people. Like, I've watched enough House to know that I don't like this trope when it's gender flipped, so I don't really like it here. I think they could have handled that stuff better, but Karai stands on her own as a character pretty well, so I'm not bothered by it as much. When I was 14 and watching this show for the first time, I was really down for these two getting together. But there was this unease, and the fandom was kind of fueling it as a very popular theory started to pop up. Backstory context for the series. Prior to getting turned into a rat man, Hamato Yoshi, aka Master Splinter, was married to a woman named Tang Shen, and they had a daughter named Miwa. Shredder had killed the two of them 16 years prior to the start of the series. And Karai popping up and being Shredder's daughter immediately started the theory that she was actually Miwa. I didn't want this theory to be true because they had already set up her to have a romance with Leo, and if she was Splinter's daughter, that would make them brother and sister, and that would make that incest. The TMNT 2012 writers, who air their show on Nickelodeon, would never do that. And then the season one finale hit. <gasps> Miwa? Okay, I'm going home. The writers had the option to not make Karai and Leo related after they made them love interests, but they did. And before anyone goes, but they're technically not related. Technically, if you if the words use the word technically, you're already in trouble. <laughs> Now Leo eventually learns that Karai is Splinter's daughter, but it doesn't mean that the romance subplot goes away after that. Nothing ever happens. They don't kiss or form a relationship, but they're still very obviously implying that something might happen between the two. Karai knows that Leo likes her and will flirt with him to get him on her side or to distract him. And this happens before the sibling reveal, but it happens after as well. Luckily, we can go full episodes without it being a thing, but even all the way into season 5, they never fully drop it. And it's really weird because they simultaneously do and don't treat it like it's incest. Like, no one ever goes, Hey, it's weird that Leo has a crush on her sister, but they don't treat it like she's not their sister. Splinter says that they're all his kids, and Mikey consistently refers to Karai as their sister. But Raph will constantly call Karai Leo's girlfriend, and Donnie has made a couple of comments about it. Mikey has also compared how Leo feels about Karai to how Donnie feels about April. It's like the writers can't decide which one they want or aren't sure whether or not it's incest. By the way, I saw a comment on Tumblr saying that Splinter actively encouraged incest, and I don't like the way they handled any of this either, but that never happens. He never encourages anything romantic between Karai and Leo, even before he knew Karai was his daughter. You don't need to make up lies to say why you think this relationship is problematic, guys. And it's very obvious that making Karai Splinter's daughter was set up from the beginning. You don't introduce a possibly dead daughter without the need for a reveal later. Chekhov's baby and all that. So why make Leo have a crush on Karai if they knew that this was going to happen? And I pretty much have said everything I need to say about this relationship. Because the writers should have chosen either a family relationship or a romantic one, not both. Or neither. Honestly, they never fully commit to either, but that's a different video. So how did future TMNT projects respond to this romance? While well, the Bay movies didn't make them related or romantic interests. And then there's Rise which very clearly is responding to 2012, but by having the characters go in complete opposite directions for a possible romance. Instead of Karai being a member of the Foot, she's now Splinter's ancestor, and because of the way Rai's mutation works, this makes her biologically related to the turtles. They call her Gram Gram. It's really cute. And Leo... He's, a uh, He, um... He's a bit, um... Just a bit, uh... I'll see you guys later, after I save the day. Bye bye oh. Dude, this wrestling thing is out of control. You gotta get on my team and get the trickle down. Leo had it again. Jump. Wow. <laughs>
Wow, you guys are handsome. Look, it's not not there in other versions, but Roy's turned him into a full fruit ninja. Um, can we kick it in the future together? Just you and me for a little while? Aw, I would love that, Mikey. Maybe someday. Now we have Mikey's romances. And if Donnie's are the most annoying and uncomfortable, and Leo's is the most controversial, then Mikey's are the most boring. Sorry to the shippers, but they're very clearly the least popular ships among the canon ones. And yes, you heard the plural noises correctly. Mikey gets two love interests for some reason. The first is Renette, a reoccurring TMNT character who appears in a few continuities. And watching those other continuities, you don't really understand why they would pick Renette to be Mikey's love interest as he's no closer to her than any of the other turtles. So there isn't really a reason other than that she's a female character who is there. Well, there is the one moment in Mirage when they first meet where one of the turtles calls Renette a babe, but it's hard to tell which one it is because this was before the masks were different colors and you can't see which weapons they have. But that issue was co-written by Dave Sim, who once characterized women as without a glimmer of understanding of intellectual process, as well as said and did a whole bunch of other misogynistic and gross stuff that you can read about on his Wikipedia article. So I tend to ignore this moment. And before this romance even starts, there's a major problem. As 30 seconds before Renette appears, Mikey says, Dudes, I'm never gonna have a crush on a girl. Uh-uh. No way, no sir. Last November, I watched the Enola Holmes movies and the Wednesday series on Netflix. Aside from them both being about teen girls who solve mysteries, both also had the lead characters state early on that they didn't want husbands, only for both of them to end up with love interest. It's actually pretty common in a lot of media for a character to state that they'll never be in love or want a relationship, and their happy ending is them being with someone romantically. This is a problem, especially in kids' media. It sets up this idea early on that the only way someone can be happy is for them to have a romantic relationship with someone, and that it's a flaw if you don't want that. But this isn't a flaw in real life. There are people who will either have no or very few romantic relationships and live just as fulfilling lives as those that do. But the media will make it out a lot of the time that this is impossible and make people feel like their lives are incomplete without some great romance. But that's not true. And I can't bring up people not wanting to be in romantic relationships without acknowledging that aromantic people exist. For those that don't know, aromantic is a romantic orientation where someone doesn't feel romantic attraction to others. There are variations and shades of grey within this orientation as well as the sexuality version called asexual, but aromantic people have romance pushed on them right from childhood. I can't name a single piece of media that is absent of even the mention of romance of some kind. And while there are characters that express disgust towards romance, it's normally presented as something that they will eventually grow out of. That it's a sign of maturity that they eventually find the love of their life and not just something they already know about themselves. Aromantic characters are almost non-existent across all media, let alone in mainstream media. And the very few well-known Arrow characters will sometimes just have that part of themselves erased or only have this confirmed outside of the work itself by creators. As a result, aromantic people have to look to characters who show just some kind of disdain for romance or just don't have canon love interests as their source of representation. With that representation being taken away once the creators run out of story ideas and decide that they need to add a romantic subplot, most often of the straight variety. Given all that, presenting it as a flaw that Mikey doesn't want to have a crush only to have it solved by meeting the perfect girl is very ridiculous. Especially given that this show is meant for younger kids, and I don't know about y'all, but kids tend not to care about romance in their action shows. Unless you were me and were pairing up the Legion of Superheroes with every episode that came out. Maybe I should actually talk about the romance itself now? I don't think a lot of thought went into it. Mikey's relationship with Renette doesn't affect him as a character and is only brought up when she's around or to make fun of him. But the latter is true for every aspect of Mikey in this show. It's hard to care about their romance because it's just Mikey hitting on her and her being amazed because her celebrity crush is into her. I will say that there's nothing inherently harmful about the romance itself. There's no incest, no stalking, no disrespecting of boundaries. It's just kind of there and pretty standard. 
but I think that the only reason that this romance happened might be because of casting. In the 2012 series, Mikey is voiced by Greg Sipes, while Renette is voiced by Ashley Johnson. This series makes it the fourth time that they've portrayed a couple. First in Teen Titans with Beast Boy and Terra, then in Super Robot Monkey Team Hyper Force Go, I'm sorry about the pauses, the only way I can say that, with Jinmei and Chiro, and finally in Ben 10 with Kevin Levin and Gwen Tennyson. The first two having Ciro Nielli, the creator of the 2012 series, on production staff. I don't know if they've ever been in a project together that doesn't have the two as love interests. So either one of the two things happened. Either they decided that Renette should be Mikey's love interest and cast Ashley Johnson, or they cast Ashley Johnson and decided that Renette should be Mikey's love interest. But other than that, there isn't really much to say about it. Mikey flirts with Renette for a whole episode, they share a kiss, she comes back for a four-parter later and the same thing happens. It's the standard romance of the week and is pretty boring. Between all the brothers, Mikey actually has had the most amount of love interests. And not just in 2012, but across all versions. And they've never adapted the same love interest twice. So every time Mikey gets a love interest, it's not because of a past version. It is always just a conscious choice to do that. And sometimes they do it in a way that is kinda not fine. Mikey gets overly flirty and in some media, uncomfortably horny. In Next Mutation, they make him really uncomfortably horny about Venus when he first meets her. And in the Bay films, Oh, she's so hot, I can feel my shell tightening. Megan Fox. Me Me Megan. Megan, you're not watching this video. But if you ever want to hunt Michael Bay for sport, I will help. Let's play walk the dog. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. We're like so similar, Shinigami. About a season after we meet Runette, we're introduced to Mikey's second love interest, Shinigami. I will not lie that they kind of popped off when they made a ninja witch and I want her in more TMNT things. <laughs> Like Mikey's romance with Renette, this one is also boring and pretty samey, but I find it more annoying. And it's not just because Mikey already had his love interest for the series. You can have multiple romances for a character, I think we all know that. But I find it annoying because Mikey's relationship with her is practically non-existent. He flirts at her and there's never anything beyond that. And you can't even say that it's joke flirting because Mikey gets the big giant hearts when he sees her for the first time that all the other romances get. We at least see Sheenie get a minute of not being a love interest before she gets dragged into it. Now, does Mikey having a second love interest automatically mean there's a second love triangle in this show? Yes. And no. On the one hand, the show never treats it like they need to pit either romance against each other. We never see Renette and Sheenie meet just to fight over Mikey like we see with Casey and Donnie. On the other hand, fandom is gonna fandom, and if you don't expect to ever see some posts comparing relationships on social media, then you'd be wrong. Why have we gotta make two bad bitches fight each other when they can just make them date instead? Granted, this is one of the few times polyamory isn't seen as a viable solution to a love triangle, but that's because the fandom likes to infantilize 12 Mikey all the time. So does the show. But the romance between him and Chini isn't really unnecessary, as like with Donnie and April, it actually ends up going nowhere. It makes what could have been a potentially interesting dynamic into a couple of flirtations. Their relationship could still be Mikey cracking jokes and Chini finding him funny without there being a romantic context to it. Besides, Mikey loves to make friends, why can't he just have another one? How do future continuities deal with any of the characters or their potential romances? They don't. Renette hasn't appeared in any continuity for a few years now, and Chini has only ever appeared in 12. Please put her in more things. She's the best new character to come out of the show. The trend of never giving Mikey the same love interest seems like it's going to continue. I just hope the next one has more substance to it than these two. So is there any good romance in the show? Well, to go back to Shani, she and Karai are somewhat coded to be a couple and are even shipped by one of the writers. So I choose to believe that they're canon. Then there's Bebop and Rocksteady, which also get the same big giant cartoon heart that half the turtles get when they see their love interest for the first time. So take that how you will. Also tied for fifth for the most gay thing in TMNT. Right behind O3 Leo Sagi, Rise Leo, actual LGBT characters, and whatever it is Krang and Shudder have going on. I don't count Shen and Yoshi as an actual romance because she's just a device to be fridged to fuel his Man pain arc. For the turtles, there is only one good romance in the show. 
What are you waiting for? Now's the time for kissy nose. <laughs> Raph and Mona are adorable. Their relationship is the only one of the series that was romantic in another iteration. Raph is also the turtle that ends up with the most serious romances, the most well-liked, and is the only turtle to ever get married. Raph's first serious relationship is Umeko, who is better known as Ninjara in the Archie continuity. She is a mutant fox ninja, and the two's relationship was really well-liked. When the IDW continuity came out, due to some copyright stuff, they couldn't use her, so created Alopex, an arctic fox mutant ninja. But Mona Lisa's existence doesn't come from the comics, although she would eventually appear in the IDW series, but from the 1987 series. She only gets one appearance, and she and Raph never form a relationship, but she stood out a lot and was really memorable. One of the things that worked about the episode was that Mona could match Raph for his one-liners. 87 Raph is the least like all the other Raphs in that he doesn't really have anger issues and instead is just kind of a sarcastic asshole. Their dynamic also worked because they would both call each other out on their dumb behavior while still having a common goal, which forced them to stick together and bond. I wish she had appeared again because the two of them are adorable in every single continuity for some reason. But just adapting Mona to be the same as her 1987 counterpart for 2012 wouldn't have worked. Like I said, 87 Raph is very different from all the other Raphs, especially 2012 Raph. 12 Raph is the tough, angry guy with a soft side for those he cares about, even if he doesn't show it very often. They would want different things from their potential partners, and having him date a science major with witty one-liners wasn't going to work in this show. So, Mona is heavily reworked. Instead of a mutant lizard, she is an alien from a lizard-like species called Salamandarians. Instead of being a scientist, she's a warrior fighting against an alien species attacking her home planet. Instead of being Raph's height, she is six feet tall and can throw a man across the room no problem. Apparently, there were people that were mad that she wasn't like her 87 counterpart, but I think TMNT works best when they try new things with different characters, and I really like what they did with her. And out of all the love interests, she has the best introduction, because we spend more than three seconds with her before Raph starts to fall for her. Hell, Raph meets her and isn't automatically into her. We spend almost three and a half minutes with her before Raph gets a crush on her. That's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things, but it's longer than the less than a minute Shinny got, the 10 seconds Karai and Renette got, and the zero seconds April had. Raph also has a reason to like Mona outside of just a physical attraction to her. She is tough, a great fighter who can stand up for herself and can easily throw him across the room like he weighs nothing. I've never been hit like that before. Raph in this show really is the definition of You want a girlfriend who not only could kick your ass, but will do so upon request. It's constantly shown how much Raph likes her for her strength and being better than fighting at him. I feel like in any other kids show, hell even most adult shows, there would be an episode about Raph being insecure that his girlfriend is stronger than him, and then have another five episodes about it because this show repeated everything. But somehow the writers got this right and just let him be into it. There's a scene where Raph starts to tell off Bishop for insulting Mona, and Mona says that she can handle herself. Raph then immediately backs off, and Mona starts going at Bishop herself, and you can see Raph in the background being so into it. Aside from reinforcing how into his girlfriend Raph is, it also shows how he is as a boyfriend. Because, yes, he stands up for her, but the second she says she's got it covered, he immediately backs off. He respects what she's capable of, and you don't just see it with her. He lets people fight their battles and let them prove themselves when they need to. You see it when he has to continually stop Donnie from trying to fight in April's place and points out that she needs to do things herself. Fun fact, in a piece of the original concept art, it shows that Raph was originally supposed to be the one with a crush on April. And given how well Raph and Mona's relationship went, I would say I might have actually not hated that. Or they could have written it just as bad as Donnie and April. Who knows? Now, one continuous thing with all these relationships is the reaction from the brothers to the crushes. Mostly it involves a lot of making fun of each other, but Raph actually gets poked at the least in terms of his relationships. 
There's never the outright mockery of Donnie and April, the constant moral outcry of Leo and Karai, the disbelief of Mikey and Renette, the... Did anyone actually have anything to say about Mikey and Shinny? Anyways, Raph gets a bit of early mockery for his crush, most of which is from Casey, but some support from Mikey. Wow, you really got a crush on that salamander hottie? She's like bigger, stronger, and probably a better fighter than you. Exactly. What a woman. Raph gets it. But it doesn't go past some light ribbing except for this. I totally get mutants like Karai, but alien lizards? I can't believe Raph has the hots for a big newt. I know, right? He's got weird taste. Sir, you are into your sister. Also, Raph is the normal one in every version. He's never had a human love interest sticking to mutants and aliens, which is what Eastman and Laird want because they don't like her human ex-turtle romances. I can see why. But the Raph and Mona relationship isn't one-sided in how much they like each other. Mona is just as into Raph as he is into her. She is the one that actually initiates their physically intimate moments, and you can actually see her getting flustered when Raph flirts with her. Her name also isn't actually Mona Lisa, it's Yagidba. Raph has some trouble pronouncing her name and asks to use a nickname. His reason? There's this painting of, like, the most beautiful woman in art and stuff. She's into it. I think it's a really good compliment, but, um, uh, we gotta talk about some real-world stuff that can actually sour this moment for a lot of people. See, in real life, there are people from cultures that have names that white people have decided are hard to pronounce. And instead of even making an attempt to pronounce their names, they'll just decide to call them by an anglicized version of their names. And it sucks, and it's kinda happening here. I don't think the writers were thinking about this at all when they wrote this moment, so it still sucks, but it's an unintentional sucking. That doesn't erase how real-life people feel about this moment, and you should listen to these people when they say it makes them upset. I went over that pretty quickly because I am white, with a name that is pretty common in America, and I'm not fully informed on the topic. If you know a lot more, please comment down below, because I am not sure what to Google to do more research on the topic. Uh, back to more on the couple. Low-key, these two are also the most accurate representation of horny teenagers. They are not love at first sight. They're both really into how good the other is at fighting and decide they want to make out when they are out of danger. Well, not make out, they nose nuzzle and it's so cute! <laughs> but also, as much as they want to make out with each other, they know they need to put the mission first. Most of the time. While Raph clearly wants to impress her when he catches up to her, he still makes sure to actually put saving everyone else first. Raph does get to save Mona a few times, but it never takes away Mona's badassness, nor does it turn her into a prize. The first time is fighting ice dragons, which she can handle and isn't captured by. The next time, Raph isn't even aware that he's going to end up saving her. He's there for a completely separate reason. He gets to save her, and they get to be a badass battle couple later, and also get to be adorable! He asks her out, and then we find out later that they've written love letters to each other off screen, Which only gets confirmed again later, but still. And the next time they reunite, you know what Raph sees when he sees her? STARS! <laughs> yes, he gets the little heart eyes like the other guys, but while the others get this big giant heart background over their love interest, Raph sees stars when he sees Mona. They both do, because I will never be able to stop explaining how adorable they are without just playing 80% of their scenes. You know what? I'm doing this. They can be added to my straight passing couples I actively like group. Congrats you two, this is a high honor. Okay, so we do need to talk about something that people don't like about this couple. The betrayal. Mona betrays Raph and the turtles to Lord Dreg, causing them to get kidnapped, and it breaks Raph when she does it. But Mona wasn't working for Dread this whole time. Dreg found out about Mona and Raph's relationship and threatened to invade Mona's planet if she didn't follow through. This would be very in character for Mona. She's a warrior who fights for her people and would do anything to protect them, and while she would not want to betray Rav, she's still only known him for less than a year and her people come first. And she still feels bad for what she's done and does save Rav once she realizes that Dreg was going to invade her planet either way. Now, betrayal can cause a lot of people to stop liking a couple. And sometimes it doesn't have to do with the person doing the betraying and more to do with the reaction to the one who's been betrayed. But Raph doesn't suddenly start threatening her or stop accepting her help when she does come back to him. 
Yeah, he is mad and he says how he feels, but he suddenly doesn't start being a huge asshole to her. The betrayal and Raph's reaction to it never reach a point where you feel like they can't fix their relationship. And her saying that she loves him is what helps him get back to his normal self. And after she is hurt protecting him, it looks like they will reconcile. We sadly don't get to see Mona till the next season when she gets sent to Earth to fight the Neutralizer. And Raph is missing her at the start of the episode, and it's so cute. Aside from the fact that I don't like every couple he sees while being sad over his girlfriend. When they see each other again, Raph actually asks her to move to Earth with him. And at the end of the episode, she agrees. Meaning that we will see her. I'm not going to pretend that we do see more of her. The biggest flaw of this couple is that their screen time is really good, but there is so little of it. Despite the fact that Ona is supposed to be part of the Mighty Mute Animals after this, when they show up again, she is not with them. She'd be their strongest member, and they don't even reference her existence. It's also really upsetting because this is the TMNT 87 crossover episode, and we could have gotten some reference to 87 Raph and Mona. But no, the best couple in the show barely gets any screen time. And that might be a good thing. Something I've learned from watching too many CW shows and this one, is that having a couple get too much focus can sometimes end up being a bad thing. It can turn a couple that is well-liked into the most annoying thing on the planet, especially if you neglect all the other relationships a character has built just to focus on the couple. I still think they deserve more screen time, but it should definitely be balanced out with other stuff for the characters, which brings me to the second biggest problem with this couple. Mona didn't really interact with the other turtles. This is actually a really big problem with all the love interests, but Mona might have it the worst. While the other girls at least have dialogue with at least one of the other turtles, Mona pretty much just interacts with Raph. And I don't need her to be besties with the other three. Most romantic partners are not super close with their partner's siblings, at least in my experience. But if someone is super close with their siblings, then it should be made a priority to show how the person that they're dating interacts with those siblings. Especially if it's pretty much their only friend group like it is in TMNT. Mona doesn't also interact with the extended turtle allies either. Like I said, she's supposed to be a mighty mutanimal by the end of the show, but we never see her with them. She doesn't interact with Casey or April, and I actively wish she and Kurai were besties. It would also make her less isolated when she moves to Earth, and would give her more of a reason to want to stay outside of just Raph. Just make it so that she has more friends and you instantly fix this. So how does future TMNT media react to their relationship? Well, Raph does not have a girlfriend in Rives. And that actively makes me angry. Here's the thing. Raph is the only turtle where, in almost every version, I am okay having a girlfriend. And this version specifically is the one that is most boyfriend-shaped. I'm assuming. Look, I'm a 24-year-old lesbian monster fucker, not a teenage attracted to men scaly. He's very responsible in this version and is actually the oldest, so has to look out for the other three and make sure they don't do anything stupid. So I think it would be cute if he had a crush on a girl and the brothers encourage him to ask her out. Make it so that he does something for himself for once. It'd be very adorable if he thinks he shouldn't do it and his brothers tell him that there's nothing wrong with being selfish and wanting to ask out a girl. Specifically Mona. Everyone adding her to your Rise fix and art, I love you. Rise also shows a lot of domestic moments, so I think it would be funny if they had a family dinner where Mona meets his family. And obviously one of the conflicts is Draxum and Splinter trying to get along in front of her to make sure everything goes right for Raph, while at the same time wanting to just fight each other every second. Please renew Rise already, Nick. (laughs) Yes, she seems so frail and clumsy when you first look at her. Like a silly red bird. (sighs) Well, this Kuro each tracked your butt down, Karai! So, why am I talking about this now, five years after the show ended? Very simply, I got really obsessed with TMNT randomly again, and I'm a shippy person, so why not? I also just can't not criticize romance in the media, it's the only way I can get through half of it. But I specifically chose this version for analyzing its romance due to it being in your face in almost every episode for three whole seasons, and how these problems never really went away. Also, how it actually shows a bigger problem than just bad romance. Every single reoccurring female character in this show is a love interest. The exception is literally the Utram Queen and maybe Brooke, who is also an Utram. And I'm not even sure if she's a girl because Utram just use these bodies to exist in the human world and we know that male Utram have used bodies that are meant to come across as female anyways. There are significantly less female characters than male ones in the TMNT franchise. 
Typically, there will be one or two reoccurring female characters in each version that become main things the fandom will talk about. If not introducing them, then bringing them more focus and making future TMNT projects want to adapt them. Obviously, you have April, who is the turtle's main human ally in almost every version, introduced in the Mirage comics. That being said, she is the only female character in the comics to make it into the 1987 series, with most of the other ones that you know about from Mirage being first adapted into the 2003 series. Kurai being the second most well-known female character of the franchise, and a lot of her common characterizations are actually adapted from the O3 series rather than the comics. But there is another character, Angel, who is introduced in the series and is later adapted back into the comics as well. While none of Ryza's characters have been adapted into other media so far, the show probably introduces the most amount of reoccurring female characters. Sunita, a yokai friend of April's, Big Mama, the spider yokai head of the Battle Nexus, and Cassandra Jones, who is actually meant to be their version of Casey, and we love her in this version. And if 1987 didn't always have the best written characters, there's still quite a few that just appear. Like, they're only important for one episode, but they stick out. And there are a few reoccurring ones, like Lotus Blossom, Kala, and April's best friend, Irma, who actually does appear in the 2012 series. <laughs> Holy Chalupa! Turtles! 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 Okay, so let's talk about that. In season two, we meet April's friend Irma, and she is eventually revealed to actually be Krang Subprime in disguise, most memorable villain in the whole show. The choice to have Irma not actually be Irma was divisive among fans. And while I may love Krang Subprime as a villain, no one ever offers the suggestion that maybe there's a real Irma out there that got replaced. Fans did want to see Irma get adapted again, especially given that the character hasn't been seen since the 87 series ended. So to never follow up on something like this is a lot of wasted potential, leaving open the question of why the writers didn't do this or what could have happened to the real Irma if she existed. I'll tell you what would have happened. She would have been made a love interest for one of the turtles. I don't know which one. Probably Donnie for him to get over April and to make the love triangle even more annoying. Or Leo to get over Karai. Probably Mikey, though, because he had no love interest before the end of season three. Not rough, though. Non-human dating king. <laughs> it just feels like the writers of the show can't fathom the idea of a teenage boy wanting to hang out with a girl for any other reason besides wanting to date her. And sometimes it works, but even the best relationship in this show reveals how ill-equipped the writers were when it came to writing their female characters. It's really disappointing to get introduced to cool female characters only for it to take less than a minute for them to be love interests. The rest of the female characters who appear only do so once, or are pets. Bigfoot is a lady, and sadly she doesn't even break the love interest chain because she has a thing for Donnie. April's mom, who isn't even actually April's mom, but a clone alien hybrid thing. Alopex, who almost entirely avoids being a love interest, but you also have to remember that she's Ralph's girlfriend in the IDW continuity. And then Tang Shen, who is fridge to fuel Splinter's man pain. The literal only exception to being a love interest is Mira, who is a mutant meerkat who only appears in the Mad Max homage three-parter. Congrats, Mira, you win. Also, there's a total of eight female characters in this show, what the fuck? Oh wait, nine, I forgot about this reporter lady. I don't really think she counts as a character, though, just a way to get exposition out. Not to compare to other series, but I double-checked for the 2003 series, and they have over 20 female characters. Which is kind of like saying there's over 30 LGBT characters in Supernatural, but still. Women just kind of casually exist in the O3 series, while in the 2012 series, they're an exception. An exception that almost every time gets explained to exist with love interest. And justifying that the only reason that the guys would ever want to talk to the girls is because one of the turtles sees them as a love interest is a pretty horrifying thing to put in a kid's TV show. This is already a problem in media meant for all their audience as well, as there is a lot of media that just has a female characters exist only to be love interests. Or even if they are more than that, the writers still feel the need to put her with a guy anyways. And it creates the idea that women only exist to be prizes for the guys, and some men apply that to real life. And before anyone says that we're past that point in the media, we really aren't. 
I think most characters are passing the sexy lamp test, but it's still rare to get a female character who doesn't end up with a guy at the end of the story. Strong female character who don't need no man is a slightly annoying trope, but there's a difference between that and just not making a character be in any way romantically attracted to a guy. It's better than just really bad writing. Which is why I'm pretty happy with almost none of the characters ending up in relationships at the end of the series. It doesn't undo all the bad stuff they've already done, but it could have been worse. That's right, Mikey. And we'll do it together. Right, Sensei? The show has really put a strain on turtle romance, making future creators wary of adding it to any future series. Which, for some, is great because they don't have to deal with it. But for others, not so much. As it closes off possible well-written storylines because of the mistakes of the 2012 series. And I don't think the response to one piece of media doing something bad should be closing off the whole franchise from it. And there's nothing wrong with a break or even never really doing romance in certain types of media. Keep it out of the movies, y'all. Those should just be an hour and a half to two hours of brotherly bonding and angsty ring fights. I know what I'm about. But instead of closing off future projects from romance, what TMNT creators should be doing is learning from the romances of the 2012 series, because you can learn just as much from bad media as you do from good. And there is so much to learn. Making sure a character isn't just a love interest and is fully developed, giving them relationships outside of the romance itself, recognizing when something is no longer cute but instead creepy, not making every character automatically be a love interest, actually thinking about if the romance would be good for both characters, and honestly the most important, not making the romantic pair related. <laughs> Game of Thrones gave everyone brain rot. Thank you all for watching. I know I promised this would be the next video and the last video I uploaded and now it's basically five months later. I really don't have an excuse. Anyways, do you have a favorite canon romance or are you in camp? Turtles should always be single. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe as well as getting me to 1000 subscribers means I will do an Earth 27 live stream. I kind of hope I don't get that many. Anyways, I will see you all next time.